Section seven of Youth by Leo Tolstoy, translated by C. J. Hogarth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section seven, chapters twenty five through twenty eight. Chapter twenty five. I become better acquainted with the Nekhludoffs. When I returned to the veranda, I found that they were not talking of me at all, as I had anticipated. On the contrary, Varenika had laid aside the book and was engaged in a heated dispute with Dmitri, who, for his part, was walking up and down the veranda, and frowningly adjusting his neck and his collar as he did so. The subject of the quarrel seemed to be Ivan Yakovlevitch, and superstition. But it was too animated a difference for its underlying cause not to be something which concerned the family much more nearly. Although the princess and Lubov Sergeyevna were sitting by in silence, they were following every word, and evidently tempted at times to take part in the dispute. Yet always, just when they were about to speak, they checked themselves, and left the field clear for the two principals, Dmitri and Varenika. On my entry the latter glanced at me with such an indifferent air that I could see she was wholly absorbed in the quarrel, and did not care whether she spoke in my presence or not. The princess, too, looked the same, and was clearly on Varenika's side, while Dmitri began, if anything, to raise his voice still more when I appeared, and Lubov Sergeyevna, for her part, observed to no one in particular, "'Old people are quite right when they say, "'Si jeunesse savait, si vieillesse pouvait.'" Nevertheless, this quotation did not check the dispute, though it somehow gave me the impression that the side represented by the speaker and her friend was in the wrong although it was a little awkward for me to be present at a petty family difference, the fact that the true relations of the family revealed themselves during its progress, and that my presence did nothing to hinder that revelation, afforded me considerable gratification. How often it happens that for years one sees a family cover themselves over with a conventional cloak of decorum, and preserve the real relations of its members a secret from every eye! How often, too, have I remarked that the more impenetrable, and therefore the more decorous, is the cloak, the harsher are the relations which it conceals. Yet once let some unexpected question, often a most trivial one, the color of a woman's hair, a visit, a man's horses, and so forth, arise in that family circle, and without any visible cause there will also arise an ever-growing difference until in time the cloak of decorum becomes unequal to confining the quarrel within due bounds, and, to the dismay of the disputants and the astonishment of the auditors, the real and ill-adjusted relations of the family are laid bare, and the cloak, now useless for concealment, is bandied from hand to hand among the contending factions, until it serves only to remind one of the years during which it successfully deceived one's perceptions. Sometimes to strike one's head violently against a ceiling hurts one less than just to graze some spot which has been hurt and bruised before. And in almost every family there exists some such raw and tender spot. In the Nekhludoff family that spot was Dmitri's extraordinary affection for Lubov Sergeyevna, which aroused in the mother and sister, if not a jealous feeling, at all events a sense of hurt family pride. This was the grave significance which underlay for all those present, the seeming dispute about Ivan Yakovlevitch and superstition. In anything that other people deride and despise, you invariably profess to see something extraordinarily good," Varenika was saying in her clear voice, as she articulated each syllable with careful precision. Indeed, retorted Dmitri with an impatient toss of his head. Now, in the first place, only a most unthinking person could ever speak of despising such a remarkable man as Ivan Yakovlevitch, while, in the second place, it is you who invariably profess to see nothing good in what confronts you. Meanwhile, Sofia Ivanovna kept looking anxiously at us as she turned first to her nephew, and then to her niece, and then to myself. Twice she opened her mouth as though to say what was in her mind and drew a deep sigh. Varia, please go on reading, she said at length, at the same time handing her niece the book, and patting her hand kindly. I wish to know whether he ever found her again. As a matter of fact, the novel in question contained not a word about any one finding any one else. 
"'And Misha, dear,' she added to her nephew, despite the glum looks which he was throwing at her for having interrupted the logical thread of his deductions, "'you had better let me poultice your cheek, or your teeth will begin to ache again.' After that the reading was resumed, yet the quarrel had in no way dispelled the calm atmosphere of family and intellectual harmony which enveloped this circle of ladies. Clearly deriving its inspiration and character from the Princess Maria Ivanovna, it was a circle which for me had a wholly novel and attractive character of logicalness, mingled with simplicity and refinement. That character I could discern in the daintiness, good taste, and solidity of everything about me, whether the handbell, the binding of the book, the settee, or the table. Likewise I defined it in the upright, well-corseted pose of the princess, in her pendant curls of grey hair, in the manner in which she had at our first introduction called me plain Nicholas, and he in the occupations of the ladies, the reading and the sewing of garments, and in the unusual whiteness of their hands. Those hands, en passant, showed a family feature common to all, namely the feature that the flesh of the palm on the outer side was rosy in color, and divided by a sharp straight line from the pure whiteness of the upper portion of the hand. Still more was the character of this feminine circle expressed in the manner in which the three ladies spoke Russian and French, spoke them, that is to say, with perfect articulation of syllables and pedantic accuracy of substantives and prepositions. All this, and more especially the fact that the ladies treated me as simply and as seriously as a real grown-up, telling me their opinions and listening to my own, a thing to which I was so little accustomed that for all my glittering buttons and blue facings I was in constant fear of being told, surely you do not think that we are talking seriously to you, go away and learn something. All this, I say, caused me to feel an entire absence of restraint in this society. I ventured at times to rise, to move about, and to talk boldly to each of the ladies, except Veronica, whom I always felt it was unbecoming or even forbidden for me to address unless she first spoke to me. As I listened to her clear, pleasant voice reading aloud, I kept glancing from her to the path of the flower-garden, where the rain-spots were making small dark circles in the sand, and thence to the lime-trees, upon the leaves of which the rain was pattering down in large, detached drops, shed from the pale, shimmering edge of the livid blue cloud which hung suspended over us. Then I would glance at her again, and then at the last purple rays of the setting sun, where they were throwing the dense clusters of old rain-washed birches into brilliant relief. Yet again my eyes would return to Veronica, and each time that they did so it struck me afresh that she was not nearly so plain as at first I had thought her. How I wish that I wasn't in love already, I reflected. Or that Sonetchka was Veronica. How nice it would be if suddenly I could become a member of this family, and have the three ladies for my mother, aunt, and wife, respectively. All the time that these thoughts kept passing through my head, I kept attentively regarding Veronica as she read, until somehow I felt as though I were magnetizing her, and that presently she must look at me. Sure enough, at length she raised her head, threw me a glance, and meeting my eyes, turned away. "'The rain does not seem to stop,' she remarked. Suddenly a new feeling came over me. I began to feel as though everything now happening to me was a repetition of some similar occurrence before, as though on some previous occasion a shower of rain had begun to fall, and the sun had set behind birch-trees, and I had been looking at her, and she had been reading aloud, and I had magnetized her, and she had looked up at me. Yes, all this I seemed to recall as though it had happened once before. Surely she is not she! was my thought. Surely it is not beginning. However, I soon decided that Veronica was not the she referred to, and that it was not beginning. In the first place, I said to myself, Veronica is not at all beautiful. She is just an ordinary girl whose acquaintance I have made in the ordinary way, whereas the she whom I shall meet somewhere and some day in some not ordinary way will be anything but ordinary. This family pleases me so much only because hitherto I have never seen anybody. Such things will always be happening in the future, and I shall see many more such families during my life. CHAPTER Twenty-six. I SHOW OFF 
At tea-time the reading came to an end, and the ladies began to talk among themselves of persons and things unknown to me. This I conceived them to be doing on purpose to make me conscious, for all their kind demeanour, of the difference which years and position in the world had set between them and myself. In general discussions, however, in which I could take part I sought to atone for my late silence, by exhibiting that extraordinary cleverness and originality to which I felt compelled by my university uniform. For instance, when the conversation turned upon country houses, I said that Prince Ivan Ivanovitch had a villa near Moscow which people came to see even from London and Paris, and that it contained balustrading which had cost 380,000 roubles. Likewise, I remarked that the Prince was a very near relation of mine, and that when lunching with him the same day, he had invited me to go and spend the entire summer with him at that villa, but that I had declined, since I knew the villa well, and had stayed in it more than once, and that all those balustradings and bridges did not interest me, since I could not bear ornamental work, especially in the country, where I liked everything to be wholly countrified. After delivering myself of this extraordinary and complicated romance, I grew confused, and blushed so much that every one must have seen that I was lying. Both Veronika, who was handing me a cup of tea, and Sofia Ivanovna, who had been gazing at me throughout, turned their heads away and began to talk of something else, with an expression which I afterwards learnt that good-natured people assume when a very young man has told them a manifest string of lies. An expression which says, yes, we know he is lying, and why he is doing it, the poor young fellow. What I had said about Prince Ivan Ivanovitch having a country villa I had related simply because I could find no other pretext for mentioning both my relationship to the Prince and the fact that I had been to luncheon with him that day. Yet why I had said all that I had about the balustrading costing 380,000 roubles, and about my having several times visited the Prince at that villa, I had never once been there, more especially since the Prince possessed no residences save in Moscow and Naples, as the Nekhludoffs very well knew. I could not possibly tell you. Neither in childhood, nor in adolescence, nor in riper years did I ever remark in myself the vice of falsehood. On the contrary, I was, if anything, too outspoken and truthful. Yet during this first stage of my manhood I often found myself seized with a strange and unreasonable tendency to lie in the most desperate fashion. I say advisedly, in the most desperate fashion, for the reason that I lied in matters in which it was the easiest thing in the world to detect me. On the whole, I think that a vainglorious desire to appear different from what I was, combined with an impossible hope that the lie would never be found out, was the chief cause of this extraordinary impulse. After tea, since the rain had stopped and the afterglow of sunset was calm and clear, the Princess proposed that we should go and stroll in the lower garden, and admire her favorite spots there. Following my rule to be always original, and conceiving that clever people like myself and the Princess must surely be above the banalities of politeness, I replied that I could not bear a walk with no object in view, and that if I did walk, I liked to walk alone. I had no idea that this speech was simply rude. All I thought was that, even as nothing could be more futile than empty compliments, so nothing could be more pleasing and original than a little frank brusquerie. However, though much pleased with my answer, I set out with the rest of the company. The Princess's favorite spot of all was at the very bottom of the lower garden, where a little bridge spanned a narrow piece of swamp. The view there was very restricted, yet very intimate and pleasing. We are so accustomed to confound art with nature that often enough phenomena of nature which are never to be met with in pictures seem to us unreal, and give us the impression that nature is unnatural, or vice versa. Whereas phenomena of nature which occur with too much frequency in pictures seem to us hackneyed, and views which are to be met with in real life, but which appear to us too penetrated with a single idea or a single sentiment, seem to us arabesques. The view from the Princess's favorite spot was as follows. On the further side of a small lake, overgrown with weeds round its edges, rose a steep ascent covered with bushes and with huge old trees of many shades of green, while overhanging the lake at the foot of the ascent stood an ancient birch-tree which, though partly supported by stout roots implanted in the marshy bank of the lake, rested its crown upon a tall straight poplar and dangled its curved branches over the smooth surface of the pond. Both branches, 
and the surrounding greenery being reflected therein as in a mirror. "'How lovely!' said the princess with a nod of her head, and addressing to no one in particular. "'Yes, marvellous,' I replied in my desire to show that I had an opinion of my own on every subject, yet somehow it all looks to me so terribly like a scheme of decoration. The princess went on gazing at the scene as though she had not heard me, and turning to her sister and Lubov Sarajevna at intervals in order to point out to them its details, especially a curved pendant bow with its reflection in the water, which particularly pleased her. Sophia Ivanovna observed to me that it was all very beautiful, and that she and her sister would sometimes spend hours together at this spot. Yet it was clear that her remarks were meant merely to please the princess. I have noticed that people who are gifted with the faculty of loving are seldom receptive to the beauties of nature. Lubov Sarajevna also seemed enraptured, and asked, among other things, how does that birch-tree manage to support itself? Has it stood there long? Yet the next moment she became absorbed in contemplation of her little dog, Susetka, which with its stumpy paws pattering to and fro upon the bridge in a mincing fashion, seemed to say by the expression of its face that this was the first time it had ever found itself out of doors. As for Dmitri, he fell to discoursing very logically to his mother on the subject of how no view can be beautiful of which the horizon is limited. Berenika alone said nothing. Glancing at her I saw that she was leaning over the parapet of the bridge, her profile turned towards me, and gazing straight in front of her. Something seemed to be interesting her deeply, or even affecting her, since it was clear that she was oblivious to her surroundings, and thinking neither of herself nor of the fact that any one might be regarding her. In the expression of her large eyes there was nothing but rapt attention and quiet, concentrated thought while her whole attitude seemed so unconstrained, and for all her shortness so dignified, that once more some recollection or another touched me, and once more I asked myself, Is it, then, beginning? Yet again I assured myself that I was already in love with Sinechka, and that Veronika was only an ordinary girl, the sister of my friend. Though she pleased me at that moment, I somehow felt a vague desire to show her, by word or deed, some small unfriendliness. "'I tell you what, Dmitri," I said to my friend, as I moved nearer to Veronika, so that she might overhear what I was going to say, "'it seems to me that even if there had been no mosquitoes here, there would have been nothing to commend this spot, whereas—' And here I slapped my cheek, and in very truth annihilated one of those insects. It is simply awful. "'Then you do not care for nature?' said Veronika, without turning her head. "'I think it a foolish, futile pursuit,' I replied, well satisfied that I had said something to annoy her, as well as something original. Veronika only raised her eyebrows a little with an expression of pity, and went on gazing in front of her as calmly as before. I felt vexed with her, yet for all that the rusty, paint-blistered parapet on which she was leaning, the way in which the dark waters of the pond reflected the drooping branch of the overhanging birch-tree, it almost seemed to me as though branch and its reflection met. The rising odor of the swamp, the feeling of crushed mosquito on my cheek, and her absorbed look and statuesque pose, many times afterwards did these things recur with unexpected vividness to my recollection. CHAPTER Twenty Seven, Dimitri when we returned to the house from our stroll, Veronika declined to sing as she usually did in the evenings, and I was conceited enough to attribute this to my doing, in the belief that its reason lay in what I had said on the bridge. The Nekhludoffs never had supper, and went to bed early, while to-night, since Dmitri had the toothache, as Sofia Ivanovna had foretold, he departed with me to his room even earlier than usual, feeling that I had done all that was required of me by my blue collar and gilt buttons and that every one was very pleased with me, I was in a gratified, complacent mood, while Dmitri, on the other hand, was rendered by his quarrel with his sister and the toothache both taciturn and gloomy. He sat down at the table, got out a couple of notebooks, a diary, and the copy-book in which it was his custom every evening to inscribe the tasks performed by or awaiting him, and continually frowning and touching his cheek with his hand, continued writing for a while. "'Oh, do leave me alone!' he cried to the maid, whom Sofia Ivanovna sent to ask him whether his teeth were still hurting him, and whether he would not like to have a 
poultice made. Then saying that my bed would soon be ready for me, and that he would be back presently, he departed to Lubov Sergeyevna's room. What a pity that Veronika is not good-looking, and in general, Sonetchka, I reflected when I found myself alone. How nice it would be if, after I have left the university, I could go to her and offer her my hand. I would say to her, Princess, though no longer young, and therefore unable to love passionately, I will cherish you as a dear sister, and you, I would continue to her mother, I greatly respect, and you, Sophia Ivanovna, I value highly. Therefore say to me, Veronika, since I ask you to be my wife, just the simple and direct word, yes, and she would give me her hand, and I should press it, and say, Mine is a love which depends not upon words, but upon deeds. And suppose next came into my head that Dmitri should suddenly fall in love with Lubotshka, as Lubotshka has already done with him, and should desire to marry her, then either one or the other of us would have to resign all thought of marriage. Well, it would be splendid, for in that case I should act thus. As soon as I had noticed how things were, I should make no remark, but go to Dmitri and say, It is no use, my friend, for you and I to conceal our feelings from one another. You know that my love for your sister will terminate only with my life. Yet I know all, and though you have deprived me of all hope, and have rendered me an unhappy man, so that Nicholas Erteniev will have to bewail his misery for the rest of his existence, yet do you take my sister, and I should lay his hand in Lubotshka's. Then he would say to me, No, not for all the world, and I should reply, Prince Nekhludoff, it is in vain for you to attempt to outdo me in nobility. Not in the whole world does there exist a more magnanimous being than Nicholas Erteniev. Then I should salute him and depart. In tears Dmitri and Lubotshka would pursue me, and entreat me to accept their sacrifice, and I should consent to do so, and perhaps be happy ever afterwards, if only I were in love with Veronika. These fancies tickled my imagination so pleasantly, that I felt as though I should like to communicate them to my friend. Yet despite our mutual vow of frankness, I also felt as though I had not the physical energy to do so. Dmitri returned from Lubov Sergeyevna's room with some toothache capsules which she had given him, yet in even greater pain, and therefore in even greater depression than before. Evidently no bedroom had yet been prepared for me, so presently the boy who acted as Dmitri's valet arrived to ask him where I was to sleep. "'Oh, go to the devil!' cried Dmitri, stamping his foot. "'Vesika, Vesika, Vesika!' he went on, the instant that the boy had left the room, with a gradual raising of his voice at each repetition. "'Vesika, lay me out a bed on the floor.' "'No, let me sleep on the floor,' I objected. "'Well, it is all one. Lie anywhere you like,' continued Dmitri, in the same angry tone. "'Vesika, why don't you go and do what I tell you?' Evidently Vesika did not understand what was demanded of him for he remained where he was. "'What is the matter with you? Go and lay the bed, Vasika. I tell you!' shouted Dmitri, suddenly bursting into a sort of frenzy. Yet Vasika still did not understand, but blushing hotly stood motionless. "'So you are determined to drive me mad, are you?' And leaping from his chair and rushing upon the boy, Dmitri struck him on the head with the whole weight of his fist, until the boy rushed headlong from the room. Halting in the doorway, Dmitri glanced at me, and the expression of fury and pain which had sat for a moment on his countenance suddenly gave place to such a boyish, kindly, affectionate, yet ashamed expression that I felt sorry for him, and reconsidered my intention of leaving him to himself. He said nothing, but for a long time paced the room in silence, occasionally glancing at me with the same deprecatory expression as before. Then he took his notebook from the table, wrote something in it, took off his jacket and folded it carefully, and, stepping into the corner where the icon hung, knelt down and began to say his prayers, with his large white hands folded upon his breast. So long did he pray that Vasika had time to bring a mattress and spread it under my whispered directions on the floor. Indeed, I had undressed and laid myself down upon the mattress before Dmitri had finished. As I contemplated his slightly rounded back and the soles of his feet, which somehow seemed to stick out in my direction in a sort of repentant fashion whenever he made his obeisances, I felt that I liked him more than ever, 
and debated within myself whether or not I should tell him all I had been fancying concerning our respective sisters. When he had finished his prayers, he lay down upon the bed near me, and propping himself upon his elbow, looked at me in silence, with a kindly yet abashed expression. Evidently he found it difficult to do this, yet meant thus to punish himself. Then I smiled and returned his gaze, and he smiled back at me. "'Why do you not tell me that my conduct has been abominable?' he said. "'You have been thinking so, have you not?' "'Yes,' I replied. And although it was something quite different which had been in my mind, it now seemed to me that that was what I had been thinking. "'Yes, it was not right of you, nor should I have expected it of you. It pleased me particularly at that moment to call him by the familiar second-person singular. But how are your teeth now? I added. Oh, so much better, Nikolinka, my friend, he went on, and so feelingly that it sounded as though tears were standing in his eyes. I know and feel that I am bad, but God sees how I try to be better, and how I entreat him to make me so. Yet what am I to do with such an unfortunate, horrible nature as mine? What am I to do with it? I try to keep myself in hand and to rule myself, but suddenly it becomes impossible for me to do so at all events impossible for me to do so unaided. I need the help and support of some one. Now there is Lubov Sergeyevna. She understands me and could help me in this, and I know by my notebook that I have greatly improved in this respect during the past year. Ah, my dear Nikolinka, he spoke with the most unusual and unwanted tenderness, and in a tone which had grown calmer now that he had made his confession. How much the influence of a woman like Lubov could do for me! Think how good it would be for me if I could have a friend like her to live with when I have become independent. With her I should be another man." And upon that Dmitri began to unfold to me his plans for marriage, for a life in the country, and for continual self-discipline. "'Yes, I will live in the country,' he said, "'and you shall come to see me when you have married Sonetchka. Our children shall play together. All this may seem to you stupid and ridiculous, yet it may very well come to pass.' "'Yes, it very well may,' I replied with a smile, yet thinking how much nicer it would be if I married his sister. "'I tell you what,' he went on presently, "'you only imagine yourself to be in love with Sonetchka, whereas I can see that it is all rubbish, and that you do not really know what love means.' I did not protest, for in truth I almost agreed with him, and for a while we lay without speaking. Probably you have noticed that I have been in my old bad humour to-day, and have had a nasty quarrel with Varya? he resumed. I felt bad about it afterwards, more particularly since it occurred in your presence. Although she thinks wrongly on some subjects, she is a splendid girl, and very good, as you will soon recognize." His quick transition from mention of my love affairs to praise of his sister pleased me extremely, and made me blush, but I nevertheless said nothing more about his sister, and we went on talking of other things. Thus we chattered until the cocks had crowed twice. In fact, the pale dawn was already looking in at the window, when at last Dmitri lay down upon his bed and put out the candle. "'Well, now for sleep,' he said. "'Yes,' I replied. "'But—' "'But what?' "'How nice it is to be alive in the daylight!' "'Yes, it is a splendid thing,' he replied in a voice which even in the darkness enabled me to see the expression of his cheerful, kindly eyes and boyish smile. CHAPTER Twenty Eight, IN THE COUNTRY Next day Woloda and myself departed in a post-chaise for the country. Turning over various Moscow recollections in my head as we drove along, I suddenly recalled Sonetchka Valakin, though not until evening, and when we had already covered five stages of the road. It is a strange thing, I thought, that I should be in love, and yet have forgotten all about it. I must start and think about her. And straightway I proceeded to do so, but only in the way that one thinks when travelling, that is to say, disconnectedly, though vividly. Thus I brought myself to such a condition that for the first two days after our arrival home I somehow considered it incumbent upon me always to appear sad and moody in the presence of the household, and especially before Katenka, whom I looked upon as a great connoisseur in matters of this kind and to whom I threw out a hint of the condition in which my heart was situated. Yet for all my attempts at dissimulation and assiduous adoption of such signs of lovesickness as I had occasionally observed in other people, I only succeeded for two days. 
and that at intervals and mostly towards evening, in reminding myself of the fact that I was in love, and finally, when I had settled down into the new rut of country life and pursuits, I forgot about my affection for Sonetchka altogether. We arrived at Petrovsky in the night-time, and I was then so soundly asleep that I saw nothing of the house as we approached it, nor yet of the avenue of birch-trees, nor yet of the household, all of whom had long ago betaken themselves to bed and to slumber. Only old hunchbacked Foka, barefooted, clad in some sort of a woman's wadded nightdress, and carrying a candlestick, opened the door to us. As soon as he saw who we were, he trembled all over with joy, kissed us on the shoulders, hurriedly put on his felt slippers, and started to dress himself properly. I passed in a semi-waking condition through the porch and up the steps. But in the hall the lock of the door, the bars and the bolts, the crooked boards of the flooring, the chest, the ancient candelabrum splashed all over with grease as of old, the shadows thrown by the crooked, chill, recently lighted stump of candle, the perennially dusty, unopened window behind which I remembered sorrel to have grown. All was so familiar, so full of memory, so intimate of aspect, so as it were knit together by a single idea, that I suddenly became conscious of a tenderness for this quiet old house. I involuntarily asked myself, how have we, the house and I, managed to remain apart so long, and hurrying from spot to spot ran to see if all the other rooms were still the same. Yes, everything was unchanged, except that everything had become smaller and lower, and I myself taller, heavier, and more filled out. Yet, even as I was, the old house received me back into its arms, and aroused in me, with every board, every window, every step of the stairs, every sound, the shadows of forms, feelings, and events of the happy but irrevocable past. When we entered our old night nursery all my childish fears lurked once more in the darkness of the corners and doorway. When we passed into the drawing-room I could feel the old calm, motherly love diffusing itself from every object in the apartment. In the breakfast-room the noisy, careless merriment of childhood seemed merely to be waiting to wake to life again. In the Devinea, whither Foka first conducted us and where he had prepared our beds, everything, mirror, screen, old wooden icon, the lumps on the walls covered with white paper, seemed to speak of suffering and of death and of what would never come back to us again. We got into bed, and Foka, bidding us good-night, retired. It was in this room that Mamma died, was it not? said Woloda. I made no reply, but pretended to be asleep. If I had said anything I should have burst into tears. On awaking next morning I beheld Papa sitting on Woloda's bed in his dressing-gown and slippers, and smoking a cigar. Leaping up with a merry hoist of the shoulders, he came over to me, slapped me on the back with his great hand, and presented me his cheek to press my lips to. "'Well done, diplomat,' he said in his most kindly jesting tone, as he looked at me with his small bright eyes. "'Woloda tells me you have passed the examinations well for a youngster, and that is a splendid thing.' Unless you start and play the fool, I shall have another fine little fellow in you. Thanks, my dear boy. Well, we will have a grand time of it here now, and in the winter perhaps we shall move to St. Petersburg. I only wish the hunting was not over yet, or I could have given you some amusement in that way. Can you shoot, Waldemar? However, whether there is any game or not, I will take you out some day. Next winter, if God pleases, we will move to St. Petersburg and you shall meet people, and make friends, for you are now my two young grown-ups. I have been telling Waldemar that you are just starting on your careers, whereas my day is ended. You are old enough now to walk by yourselves, but whenever you wish to confide in me, pray do so, for I am no longer your nurse, but your friend. At least I will be your friend and comrade and adviser as much as I can, and more than that I cannot do. How does this fall in with your philosophy, eh, Coco? well or ill, eh? Of course I said that it fell in with it entirely, and indeed I really thought so. That morning Papa had a particularly winning, bright, and happy expression on his face, and these new relations between us, as of equals and comrades, made me love him all the more. Now tell me, he went on, did you call upon all our kinsfolk and the Iwins? Did you see the old man, and what did he say to you? And did you go to Prince Ivan's? We continued talking so long that before we were fully dressed the sun had left the window of the Divinea, 
and Yakov, the same old man who of yore had twirled his fingers behind his back and always repeated his words, had entered the room and reported to Papa that the carriage was ready. "'Where are you going to?' I asked Papa. "'Oh, I had forgotten all about it,' he replied with a cough and the usual hoisting of his shoulder. "'I promised to go and call upon Epifanova to-day. You remember Epifanova, la belle flamande, don't you, who used to come and see your mamma? They are nice people.' and with a self-conscious shrug of his shoulders, so it appeared to me, Papa left the room. During our conversation, Lubotshka had more than once come to the door and asked, "'Can I come in?' But Papa had always shouted to her that she could not do so, since we were not dressed yet. "'What rubbish!' she replied. "'Why, I have seen you in your dressing-gown.' "'Never mind. You cannot see your brothers without their inexpressibles,' rejoined Papa. If they each of them just go to the door, let that be enough for you. Now go. Even for them to speak to you in such a negligee costume is unbecoming. How unbearable you are, was Lubotshka's parting retort. Well, at least hurry up and come down to the drawing-room, for Mimi wants to see them. As soon as Papa had left the room, I hastened to array myself in my student's uniform and to repair to the drawing-room. Woloda, on the other hand, was in no hurry, but remained sitting on his bed and talking to Yakov about the best places to find plover and snipe. As I have said, there was nothing in the world he so much feared as to be suspected of any affection for his father, brother, and sister, so that, to escape any expression of that feeling, he often fell into the other extreme, and affected a coldness which shocked people who did not comprehend its cause. In the hall, I collided with Papa, who was hurrying towards the carriage with short, rapid steps. He had a new and fashionable Moscow greatcoat on, and smelt of scent. On seeing me, he gave a cheerful nod, as much as to say, "'Do you remark my splendor?' And once again I was struck with the happy expression of face which I had noted earlier in the morning. The drawing-room looked the same lofty, bright room as of yore with its brown English piano and its large open windows looking on to the green trees and yellowish-red paths of the garden. After kissing Mimi and Lubotshka, I was approaching Katenka for the same purpose, when it suddenly struck me that it might be improper for me to salute her in that fashion. Accordingly, I halted, silent and blushing. Katenka, for her part, was quite at her ease, as she held out a white hand to me and congratulated me on my passing into the university. The same thing took place when Woloda entered the drawing-room, and met Katenka. Indeed, it was something of a problem how, after being brought up together and seeing one another daily, we ought now, after this first separation, to meet again. Katenka had grown better looking than any of us, yet Woloda seemed not at all confused, as, with a slight bow to her, he crossed over to Lubotshka, made a jesting remark to her, and then departed somewhere on some solitary expedition. End of section 7. Recording by Bill Borst.